So do you guys want the real story? I mean, I'm not sure why you came tonight. You know, maybe, maybe it's kind of part of a tradition. Totally cool. Maybe you got invited and, you know, you're just kind of trying to connect with the person who invited you or you, they just were so annoying you finally said yes. That's cool. Um, you know, maybe this is just kind of a part of what you do. It doesn't matter why you're here. We're just happy you're here, okay? And we want you to feel like this can be your family if that's uh, something that you would desire, your, your family of faith. But one of the things that we want to do is give you the real story. Because I know you guys like authentic. You like to just get after it, like give it to us. So I'm going to do that. Okay, here we go. I'm going to kind of start from a place that's one of my favorite places to start as it pertains to getting the real story. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree, said Charlie Brown. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I don't really know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about, said Linus. Linus walks to center stage. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherd abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. Luke 2, 8 through 14, King James Version. Linus picks up his blanket and shuffles off stage. Amen. Let's cue O Holy Night. Did you guys enjoy that? No. No, because you're just, by the way, I have this on on borrowed time from my two-year-old, so don't worry. She'll get it back. If you don't know who Charlie Brown is, you have no idea why I had that. That's, that's your own fault. Let me just, like, be real with you. You need to Google that right now, okay? We'll come back to me in a second. You're not satisfied with that. You're not satisfied with the simple surface story of Christmas. Because in our culture, I mean, like, we want to know the story behind the story. We want to know the real story. That's why if you're a sports fan, you are like minorly addicted to 30 for 30. When a 30 for 30 comes on, you can have a ton of stuff to do. It doesn't matter because you're now in to that story behind the story. It, uh, back when I was growing up, uh, VH1 started this uh, series called like uh, Behind the Music. And, and man, it was like we just wanted to get to know the people behind the story. It, like made the story come to life. Or... If you're like my three-year-old, one of the deepest theologians I know, I'm going to use a favorite word of his right now. It's not no, we've grown out of that. It's why. Why? Why this baby born? Why the shepherd? Why all of this fuss over this one divine night? So what we want to do here uh, this evening is just kind of get into the real story. We want to peel back the cover of Christmas and uncover what was really happening and, and why, like, the whole world stops and gathers for this one moment. It's probably got to be more than, than we maybe understand. So we're going to look at a, a few sort of themes that will hopefully get us into the real story. We're going we're gonna to fast forward in the New Testament all the way to this book called uh, the book of 1 John. 
Uh, the book of First John, it was written by a guy who was uh, very close to Jesus. He had an eyewitness, up-close uh, perspective on Jesus. And thankfully, he recorded some of the significant events, not all, because he actually says, if I tried to do them all, man, we'd be here forever. So under the divine inspiration of God, this guy John records some of these incredibly significant events in the life of Jesus, and, and then he writes about them. And in 1 John chapter 4, we're going to get into the real story. It'll be um, behind me on the screen here. I'll read it to you. In this... The love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 1 John 4, verse 9. Here we have the behind the scenes of the real story. We can break this verse down into kind of three components, like a, an A and a B and a C, and, they, and they, they kind of build and go with one another. And so that's what we're going to do with our time this evening. We're going to dig into what God's word has to say about God. And the beginning of this verse talks about love. And so we see from the onset that the real story is actually a love story. It's actually a love story. And I, and I think that that's probably why we all inherently kind of love Christmas. We've been talking the last few weeks in our Advent series about Hallmark movies and how they seem to capture everyone. It doesn't even matter. Even if you, like, like make fun of them quietly, you're still drawn in. We, we still kind of, like, want to see what happens in love stories because we're actually made to love and to be loved. The, the real story, it's, it's, a, it's a love story, and it's actually the point of Christmas. It's the point of Christmas. But it's not your love for your family. It's not your love for God. It's, it's not your love uh, for those around you. The point of Christmas is actually the love of God for you. And I went to, um, my, my children have this amazing Bible. If you get anything out of this message, go get yourself the Jesus Storybook Bible. <laughs> Read that over and over and over again. It'll probably be better than, than, than my messages. Just read that to yourself. Read that to your kids. They have a beautiful description of the love of God that is actually the point of Christmas. I'm gonna read it to you. This is how the author Sally Lloyd-Jones describes the love of God. The never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. It is the one way radically persistent, relentless love that meets us where we are time and time again, no matter the condition. That's the point of Christmas. That's, that's what draws the world together, even if they don't confess Jesus as their treasure and Savior and Lord. They, the world still stops and marvels at this thing we call Christmas because we cannot ignore a love like that. It's actually impossible. And at Christmas, in this love story, it's a love made manifest. The word manifest means to, to become known. Um, it, and now th this, is, this is important that you understand the context because when something is not understood in its context, it might seem odd or weird or, or out of place. I want to tell you about a, a gift that I got my wife, okay? Um, she, she doesn't know, but, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe she'll know. Um, so, so I got her this gift, and uh, you, you might not understand if I don't tell you the context, but I'm just going to tell you the gift first. The gift is I got her a night away at a hotel alone. Now, you might think, oh, man, pastor's got some marriage issues. Like, what's going on there? Like, wh why is she going off alone? Normally, I get to go on these little adventures, and that's a whole different trip, okay? This one is like, no, this is like four you it's a night alone i even got like a like a place for her to go to dinner and all these sort of things and so so if you don't understand the context of our family situation you might think that's kind of an odd gift for you to give you're a family of six and you're sending your wife away alone are you mad at her is there it no 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 see you have to understand our context we live in a circus our house is like the, I don't know the last time you've been to a circus, okay, but there's a couple of things that you marvel at. You'll just go up to it, you'll be like, oh, 
that's interesting. I never knew that somebody could ask that many questions about the same thing. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, I never knew that they could make that decision in that context. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, when you go to the circus, you, you, you go and you're kind of glad you're there. Your eyes are like, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on. I'm glad I don't live here and I think maybe I need to go home and bathe. Like that's kind of, like that's, you got animals, it's like boom. And now my wife, she is the ringmaster of the circus. She's like, cue the elephants, move it, move it, move it. Oh, that guy got eaten. We'll fix that. Band-aids and bread, no problem. Okay, and so she runs the circus. And it's a beautiful circus. I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else. I love my circus. But what would be really endearing and loving to my wife is if I were able to send her away for 24 plus hours Let her have her own agenda. Let her eat where she wants to eat. Let her sleep and get up and redo whatever it is she wants to do. But you wouldn't understand that gift unless you understood the context. And thankfully, the verse here gives us the context. It says that within this love story, it was the love of God that was made manifest where? Among us. Among us. And so what's interesting in this particular story is that this is a love that comes down into our circus. It comes down into this world of poverty and warfare and and human trafficking and crime and brokenness. Like we live, we inhabit a circus here in 2018. And at Christmas, we celebrate a love story where the God of perfection, purity, and holiness left his place in order to dwell among us and begin a work of rescue and renewal that could not happen had he not broken into humanity. This, ladies and gentlemen, this evening is a love story of epic proportion. I was thinking of words that might be able um, to, to describe it. And you might not be familiar with thinking of God and scandalous, but I think it's very appropriate I think it's very appropriate to describe the love story at Christmas if we were to kind of give you the real version, take you one step further as a scandalous love. It's actually a scandalous love. Now, the definition uh, for scandal is causing general public outrage by a perceived offense against morality or law. You see, Jesus was always loving the wrong people. That's scandalous. When you are perceivedly doing something against morality or the law. It's like, where's Jesus? Oh, he is, um, he's eating and engaging with a prostitute or, or, or with, with a tax collector or with a thief or with an adulteress. Where is he? He's in the wrong space again. And, and, and the people of Jesus' time, especially those who were deeply religious, always put Jesus with, like, under, the, under the banner of scandal. Like what he's doing is scandalous. It's perceived as immoral that he would love and associate and open his heart and his home to people like that. You see, Christmas, it's not just a love story. It is a scandalous love story. And maybe if that's who Jesus loved, and, and I hear a lot about how Jesus loves me right where I am, then, then maybe I am the thief and the prostitute and the adulteress. Maybe those things live deeply in my heart and I'm just better at covering them than 2,000 years ago. Maybe I need to hear that, that it's okay to be exactly as broken as I came in here this evening and receive the scandalous love of God at Christmas. I was thinking about my 17-year-old daughter and how it's going to be totally cool for her to date the right guy in 20 years. <laughs> um, so I, I figure I'll be close to senality. Is that the way you say it? I, I'll, I'll be losing my mind. And then in 20 years, she can, you know, she can date the right guy. But if she attempts to date um, the wrong guy at this point, I'll tell her. I'll be like, no, he's not God's best for you. 
He's not God's, but if it, it's like honest and a man, like a man of integrity and somebody who works hard, somebody who loves Jesus, somebody who's fun and adventurous, I would be one of the first people to tell her, like, that's the, that's the, that's the wrong guy for you. That's the wrong guy for you. You need to wait for the right guy. And I don't know what the scene in the heavenly host was when God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit devised the plan of redemption, but I'm certain when my name came across the banner of that's who you're going to die for, that's who you're going to love, that's who you're going to associate yourself with, the temptation must have been, you've got the wrong guy. That guy's not good for you. He's not one of us. But the scandalous love of Jesus would not be stopped, nor will it be stopped this evening. It's a scandalous love, guys. It's not the only type of love that it is as we look at the real story. Uh, the real story, is, it's, a, it's a Jesus story. The real story is a Jesus story, and thankfully so, because as, as we think about this, this type of love that meets us where we are, this type of love that like, loves the wrong guy, loves the wrong girl, you're going to need somebody who's comfortable in the mess, who's comfortable in the brokenness. Thus, enter Jesus. So what's cool is all of history points to Jesus, I mean, our dates and our calendar are set at least somewhat around the occurrence of his life and death and resurrection. And, and we know that, that, that all of the world, whether you're from a different particular persuasion of religion or background or whatever, I mean, it's like the whole world at least stops and gives honor to Christmas. You can go through the mall, you can go to Starbucks, you can go to any place and you'll hear songs like Emmanuel. You'll hear like Joy to the World. You'll see decorated places. It, 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 it's like the love of God still captures the world, even though the world may be very uncomfortable in naming it Jesus. But you guys wanted the real story. That's why you came tonight. And so I need to give you the real story. The real story, it's, it's a Jesus story story. It's not about Mary. It's not about Joseph. It's not about the shepherds. It's not about those other secondary characters, although they were incredibly important. And as I've been spending time with the Lord this week, I've been so encouraged to read about things like Bethlehem and Mary, where God is famous for not only loving the wrong people, but he's famous for then using those people to bring about his salvation for the world. It's awesome news for people like me and for people like you. But we have to remember that, that Christmas is not about us. The real story, it's not about us. The real story is about a person named Jesus. We see this here in the middle of the passage. It said that God sent his son, his only son, referring to God the son that we know as Jesus. And so when somebody gets sent, that means that they, there's a purpose behind what they're doing. Uh, usually somebody who's sent, they might have kind of two roles, sort of like an ambassador role where they're representing the person who sent them or the country that sent them, and a mission. If you got sent, you got sent to do something. You also are representative of the person or a place that sent you. And so we see in the life of Jesus that he's representative of a kingdom that doesn't look like this place. It's, it's, a, it's a kingdom that, um, for many intents and purposes, is, is opposite or counterculture to the way we do things. It's a kingdom that says you win by losing. You're first when you're last. When others flourish, you rejoice. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a backwards kingdom almost, at least in our world. And so he came and he lived this life where he spent his time not only with the wrong people, as I, as I talked about, but also with the people in the margins, like the poor and, and, and the broken and, 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 and those who don't have the same social status as, as people you might think should be around the king of kings. So he, he lived this kingdom life, but then he also was on a mission. He, he had something specific to do. And I, and I love how uh, the gospel writes about him as saying, uh, Jesus is, uh, he's like a doctor for the sick. 
when he was being questioned uh, by somebody about like, you know, why do you, why do you hang out with these people? Why do, you, why do you insist on loving the wrong people? Jesus, it's like, says, it's not the well who need the physician, it's the sick. It's the sick who need the doctor. And then later on in this passage, a few verses down, it, it, it describes exactly how Jesus brought his healing. The word, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a churchy word. I'll say it and then I'll describe it. It's propitiation. And, and when, when somebody um, acts in that manner, they are a propitiation. What, means is, what that means is they stood in the place of where wrath and anger and punishment should go, and they took it and satisfied it, specifically so somebody else wouldn't have to pay that price. That's Jesus' mission. That's how he becomes a doctor to the sick. You see, um, no matter what you brought in, no matter your history, no matter kind of your current um, involvement with faith or things like that, the, the scriptures say that we're all sick. The scriptures diagnose us all the same. And the sickness, you can call it a couple of different things. The, the, again, the biblical word for it is sin. You might label it as brokenness. You might label it as um, um, self-consumption, whatever the case may be. But there is, um, there's a sickness that we all suffer from, and, it, and it, it's because our hearts were born under this condition. Uh, we were born as sinners. We were born with a desire to serve, love, and treasure ourselves above all else. And, and yet God is, he exists in community. God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. And he, and he treasures, he's very outward focused. He, he tre- God the Son treasures God the Father, God the Father treasures God the Spirit, and so on and so forth. And so um, when we come into the world, we come into the world with uh, like, a, like a, a condition that naturally separates us from a holy God. Our sin just, it, it separates us. We, we are not only born into that condition, but then we lean into it. We actually perfect it over time, and we get better at living for self. That's not just a problem for you because nobody actually wants to be in that condition. It's a bigger problem for a holy and righteous and just God. There's a penalty that comes with that sin. The penalty is is death. There's a physical death that we all die that wasn't actually part of the original plan. There's a spiritual death where we don't actually know God the way he intended, and then there's an eternal death where God, under his righteous justice, will separate himself from us for eternity under, under his wrath. That's what our sins have earned. But remember, this is a love story. And we love stories where the king leaves his crown to go and pursue the wrong person. And that's exactly what Jesus did, is that he went to a cross, and on that cross he stood, having left his crown in our place, and and he absorbed the punishment and the wrath and the condition of God's righteous anger, he absorbed it. He took it as though it was his because he took our sins upon himself. And on the third day, after having been dead, he came back from the dead. And he overcame our sin and he overcame our death and he fulfilled the mission to be our propitiation, to be the one that would satisfy the wrath of God. This is a Jesus story. And what that does for those of us who come to receive this Jesus story, for those of us, and this is how you receive the Jesus story, you you repent and you believe. You turn from yourself and from your sin and from your old way of living, and you say, Jesus, you are enough. I trust and rest in you. When a person comes to Jesus in that way, they're both forgiven of their sin because God is righteous and will not punish sin twice, but they're also made free. They're made free from their sin in increasing measure until one day when Jesus returns and frees us completely. You see, this isn't just a Jesus story. This is a personal Jesus story. And what I love about this particular story is it meets us directly in our culture because we are a culture that wants to experience it if it's real. If this is real, if you're telling me the real story, I've got to taste it. I've got to touch, this has to get into my bones and I have to experience the change that you're talking about. And I love thinking of this not only being a Jesus story, but a personal Jesus story because he has personal forgiveness. He died for your sins personally and he has personal freedom for you. 
There are those of us who came in here under bondage this evening. It might be bondage to an addiction. It might be bondage to fear. It might be bondage to shame. I don't know what it is. But oftentimes we choose to live under voluntary slavery to that particular bondage. And the good news of Jesus Christ is not that you're just forgiven of your voluntary slavery, but you can also be made free from your voluntary slavery through faith and rest in his finished work. I want to talk to you about my Jesus just for a minute here. This is, this is my Jesus. It's the Jesus of the Bible, and it's the Jesus that you can experience through faith who comes in and says, I am good enough to where you don't need to look elsewhere. I mean, wouldn't that be such an amazing life where you could quit looking elsewhere for your life's significance and meaning and just simply rest in the person of Jesus? This is my Jesus that comes in and says, my sacrifice, my death and resurrection is great enough to where you don't need to be in control anymore. You can rest. And wouldn't that be the kind of freeing life that you would want to experience where anxiousness no longer grips your day-to-day existence? This is my Jesus who comes in and says, my death and resurrection is glorious enough to where you don't need to fear others to where you cannot walk around needing the approval of this person and that person, and your eyes can rest and stay on me, and you can actually be free to love other people, which is what your heart desperately wants to do. This is my Jesus that is gracious enough in his death and resurrection where he can make a promise that you no longer have to prove yourself to others, to yourself, or to your God. His work is enough. And that is good news. That is a love story. That is a Jesus story that will captivate you and change you and allow you to experience freedom in increasing measure all the days of your life until he comes back and gives you the fullness of that freedom. Our final thought here today as we look at this verse and the the third aspect of the verse is this idea that that, um, it's a life that he wants to give us that we might live through him. The, The author says that he wrote this book so that your joy might be complete. As I was thinking about complete joy, I was thinking, man, um, actually I was thinking about the peace of God, but the two kind of go hand in hand. How awesome would it be to live with the, like, just the overwhelming peace of God every moment of your life? It's better than any high. It's better than any other experience. It's better, it's better than you seeing your career take off. It's, I mean, it, if, if you could be under and influenced and saturated with the ultimate peace of the divine at every moment, how, I mean, what, how would that change things? So this book, that the whole book, but even specifically 1 John is, is written, there, there's a great sense of it. It all centers on Jesus, but it's for your joy. Christmas is, is not about you. It's about the love of God, but it's about the love of God that completes your joy. So the real story is actually a better story. It's actually a better story. So I don't, like, I, I don't know the story you brought in here this evening. I don't know if it's a good story and, and things are going well and it's just kind of like, man, this is, I'm, I'm living a, a good story. Right now. Or maybe you brought in a story this evening where you're like, I never thought I would be here like where I am tonight in this stage of my life. I never would have dreamed that my story would have taken me here. I don't know um, sort of what, what, your, what your story has brought in. I'm, I've got a pretty good story. I've got, I've got a pretty good story. I mean, I've, got, um, I've got four kids. They're amazing. Love them dearly. They bring me closer to Jesus. We have this awesome, awesome family dynamic. It's a place where my kids, they want to be. We want to be there. I mean, I know I kind of was making fun of this circus, but it's a circus I love. I love going to my own personal circus. I have a wife of almost 22 years. Man, and we love each other. We love, we love each other. Like, like I'm not t- talking about because we have to. Like, I'm super in love with this woman. I'm very attracted to her. We, we have all the, the right loves, the, 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 the romantic love and the mental love, the emotional love. I mean, almost 22 years of this faithful, beautiful marriage. I, I love what I do. 
I, I love that I get to influence people and see change and be a part of what God has called me into here at the Avenue Church and even beyond, man. Like, I have resources. We, we have resources. In my family, we never go hungry. My kids don't necessarily like their nighttime snack when, they, when I tuck them in, but we never go hungry. If we want to go to Chili's, yo, we're going to Chili's. I mean, we, we, have, we have what we need. So let me tell you a problem with my story. It's just never enough. My story is not enough. It's a really good story. But there's two things that my story cannot touch. The first thing it cannot touch is my deep desire for significance. Although I love being dad and husband and, and all those amazing things, I mean, I love it. I love coming home and seeing most of my family come and greet me and be happy to see me. And it uh, depends on the day, kind of like what's going on. But, but mo I, I love that. I love coaching. I, lo I love doing all those things. I love being your pastor. I love sharing God's word. It's just never enough. It doesn't fulfill my need for significance. If I look to it for that, I will continue to use all those people and places in ways they were meant, never meant to be used. They're not bad, they're not wrong, they're just not meant to be my God. You see, Christmas offers a better story because it fulfills your need and your desire to find significance. It identifies you as a child of the living God and then sends you out on a rescue and renewal mission with God your Father every day of your life. And it gives you deep significance whether I am a daddy and a pastor and a husband or God takes all of that away this evening. I still have what I need in Christ because he's a better story. The second thing it doesn't touch, the second thing my good story doesn't touch is my brokenness. You ever find yourself in a repetitive behavior pattern and, and you go through all sort of the stages of like pity or grief or hating yourself and I can't believe I'm here again? There is a deep brokenness within me that God is in the process of healing and it manifests itself in a lot of anxiousness, a lot of scattered, not fully present, broken anxiousness. And no matter how good my current story is, my beautiful wife and beautiful children in this beautiful church, it can't touch my brokenness. Only Jesus gets to touch my brokenness. And so what he's given me are all those gifts which I now can enjoy in him. But he's also given me the gift of desperation through my brokenness, which keeps me coming back to him to experience the healing and the better story that he promises to give. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you brought in here. I do know that there is a better story in the Christmas invite, if you will. The, the, the bridge to that peace of God, the bridge to the better story is the resurrected Jesus Christ, faith in his finished work, coming to him and him alone. The scripture tells us that we might live through him that Christmas is all about the love of God that was made manifest by God sending his son so that we might live through him. So my question to you tonight is who are you living through? Is it your kids or your job or any of those things that I mentioned? You know what it's like to live through your kids, right? Or to live through another relationship. You're up when they're up and you're down when they're down. Let me invite you to live through Jesus. Let me invite you to... to intimately tie how you're doing your condition with his condition well how's jesus doing right now he's doing fantastic 
He's at the right hand of the Father. He has overcome sin and death. He is waiting to come back. He is a king that walks in victory. So if I start living through him, if I start tying my condition with his condition, I'm going to start to experience a whole lot of a better story than when I tie my condition to anyone else. What does Jesus think of me? Well, because of his death and resurrection now, now he looks at me and, and, and he sees his finished work. He sees forgiveness. He actually sees his righteousness in me. So I can take my eyes off the continual brokenness that he's working out and be reminded that there is victory coming both now and in that day when he returns because of what he's doing. Where is he? He's on a rescue mission to, to seek and save the lost. And that sends me out. I love this one, and it might just be for me. Well, what's his future? Man, if I'm connected to Jesus, his future then becomes my future. If I'm living through Jesus, his future is my future. Author Tim Keller says there's a day coming where everything's sad becomes untrue and on that day when Jesus comes back which is one of his promises the joy of your glory will be that much greater for every scar you bear do you have scars that you brought in here do you have scars that you're bearing some of those scars may be healed over. Some of those scars might be wide open. Some of those scars might be manifest in some of the brokenness that I talk about through the, through the anxiousness that I walk through, even though I don't, uh, even though I don't have to. Even, it, it, like, there's a scar there because that seems to be something that calls my name and I run to more than I want to, less than I used to. It's still a scar, and here's what the resurrection says. Here's what the better story, here's what the captivatingly better story says. Because you bore that scar, because you endured that disease, because you went through that divorce, because you walked through that abuse, listen to me. In Christ, when he comes back, that personal Jesus, that love story, he's gonna touch that very tender area. And he's not just gonna give you consolation. He's gonna give you newness. He's gonna give you healing. He's gonna bring renewal, so much so that you will rejoice because you walked through it and he got to touch it in the end. That's a captivatingly better story than probably what we're living right now. And it's my joy this evening to invite you to it. So as we close and uh, oh holy night, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. We're gonna have some prayer partners that are come, gonna come to the sides. Um, we're, we're not gonna come down front here. We're just gonna move over to that side, move over to that side. You'll see some, some people over there. If, if you wanna pray, if you wanna um, sort of make your way to, to a place where tonight is a night where you wanna respond to that love, if you want to respond to a Christmas invite like that, you might not know how to do it. That might be a foreign thing to you. Let my two and three-year-old lead the way. They're the worst at playing hide and seek. They can't count to five very well. And when they hide and I come looking for them, they throw balls at me. They make noise and they come out and get me. They're the worst. But when I hide, even though they're scared, even, even though they don't know how I'm going to respond to them when they find me, my two-year-old Cora, she even covers her little ears. I don't know why she does this, but, but it's her like defense mechanism when she's scared. And sometimes she comes with her brother, and sometimes she comes alone, and sometimes she says, Mommy, come help me find Daddy, and she gets help around her to come find me, but she knows that when she seeks after her Daddy, it's gonna be good in the end, and may I invite you, no matter if you have to cover your ears or bring other people with you, Come seek after your Father. Christmas is a fantastic time to respond to that. Just come. Receive prayer. 
give your life to Christ and enjoy this peace that he promises for all who will come. Amen. We're going to rise now and sing, Oh Holy Night, and this is going to be your opportunity to respond. If that love and that Jesus and that better story is something that you want to receive at this time. Let's sing. So the question that we leave here this evening with is how do I join my story with the real story? And we'll end with the way that I try to end many, if not most, of my sermons. Make it about Jesus. Just make it about Jesus. Wherever you are, whoever you are, make it about the person of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for at this time you instituted the greatest love story that we've ever known, a a love story that captivates us. Father, and I thank you for the sound of prayer that I hear even right now. I thank you for, for how you are bringing life in this place. Holy Spirit, we, we, we talked about seeing a vision of you come in here and, and bring dead bones to life through faith. And we're believing that to be happening right now. And Lord, we, we ask that even if we weren't able to, to come and, and be prayed over, even now in this moment, if there are those who want to make it about Jesus, if there are those who want to join their story to the real story, they can come right where they are and say, come to you, Jesus, and they can repeat words that, that are similar to mine to say, Jesus, I understand. I, I'm not working well right now. My story is not complete. I'm looking for significance or for freedom. And I'm believing that through your love, through your death and resurrection, that you will give me both forgiveness and freedom, that you will complete me, Jesus, because that's what you came to do. You will complete my joy. I come to you. I turn from my sin and myself, and I look to you now as my treasure. Would you heal me and make me yours? My story is now yours. You come to him in that way, and he will not only free you, but he will use you and give you significance and complete your joy both now and in the day to come. Lord, we love you and we worship you, and we pray all this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Enjoy your evening.